The United States Postal Service is a beloved institution. 91% of Americans ranked the post office as one of their favorite government agencies in April 2020. Americans depend on the post office for prescription medication, social security checks, and old-fashioned snail mail, like birthday cards from your aunt. The U.S. Postal Service is big. It's the world's largest postal service, delivering and processing more than 472 million pieces of mail a day. It also employs more than 600,000 people. Walmart and Amazon are the only U.S. companies that employ more. The post office has been slow to adapt to changing times, and the rules surrounding its services and financials have made it hard to innovate. It's a organization that provides a universal public service by the government, uh, but at the same time, it's an organization that's required to be self-financing. The U.S. Postal Service is in the spotlight during the pandemic as Americans turn to e-commerce and concerns grow over the USPS's ability to deliver mail-in ballots for the upcoming presidential election. It's no secret the post office has been in financial trouble for years, a fact that has been politicized by President Trump. The post office is losing billions of dollars and the taxpayers are paying for that money because it delivers packages for Amazon. We reached out to the U.S. Postal Service about their financial situation. They referred us to what Postmaster General DeJoy told the USPS Board of Governors back in August 2020. Our financial position is dire, stemming from su substantial declines in mail volume, a broken business model, and a management strategy that has not adequately addressed these issues. As we have repeatedly stated, Congress and the Postal Regulatory Commission have long delayed much needed legislative and regulatory reforms to help address the situation. Here's a look at the business model of the U.S. Postal Service and why it's not working. The post office is self-financing and a business-like entity. Instead of receiving funds from the U.S. government, it relies on sales from postage stamps and its postal-related services to cover its costs. The post office's duty is bound by its mission and what's called the universal service obligations. It has to complete these regardless of cost. It includes delivery six days a week throughout the U.S. and accessibility and affordability for all citizens who use it. The post office's products are split into two categories. You have market dominant products that the post office has a monopoly on, like first class mail, periodicals, and postcards. And then you have competitive products like packages the post office has competition in this space from FedEx and UPS. Sitting above the U.S. Post Office is an independent federal agency called the Postal Regulatory Commission. They keep the post office accountable to its obligations and oversee rate changes. They make sure the post office doesn't raise prices above inflation and make sure their contracts with FedEx, UPS, and Amazon are profitable. The Postal Service was allowed to raise rates for its monopoly products by the rate of inflation and the Postal Regulatory Commission was charged with formulating the rate of inflation, reviewing the proposals of the Postal Service to raise its rates, and to assure that those rates did not go beyond the rate of inflation. And furthermore, the rates were by class. The Postal Service can raise prices on items that cost less, but take longer to process to encourage a more efficient and profitable system. The post office also has a requirement to pre-fund the health benefits of its workers for 75 years into what's called the Retiree Health Benefits Fund. Many critics pointed this as the source of the Postal Service's financial pains. There were a lot of postal workers who were getting into their 25th or even 30th year. And so you had a wave of people who were moving towards retirement. And the Postal Service, even though they had promised these workers that they would pay these retiree health benefits when they retired, you wouldn't find any mention of that obligation on their financial statements. So it looked like the Postal Service was actually in good financial condition, but in fact, there was this looming obligation. The problem comes with this enormous financial burden that's been put on the Postal Service that over the years drained most of its available cash. Uh, and has put it in a situation so that its only management options over the last 10 years have been to plan for cutbacks. And that's not good for a business that's going to survive in the long term. 
The post office's financial situation is dire. Since 2009, the U.S. Postal Service has been on the U.S. Government Accountability Office's high risk list for financial viability. The 2019 report describes the biggest challenges coming from declining mail volumes, increasing employee compensation, and the growing amount of money it has not set aside for its retiree health benefits fund. They have about $161 billion in liabilities, debts, and other obligations. Last year alone in 2019, they lost about $8.8 .8 billion. They've not been paying into their retiree health fund since around 2012 and basically have been raiding the fund to pay those costs. And under uh, current projections, that fund is expected to be exhausted by 2030. Up until the early 2000s, the post office's most profitable product was first class mail. However, since the Great Recession, it's seen a drop in volume of more than 33%. So the Postal Service's mail volumes typically follow the business cycle. When we've had a depression or a recession, mail volumes slide. When the economy starts roaring again, mail volumes go up. That recession hit, mail volume fell like a stone, but then it didn't bounce back. And that's because businesses were already in the process of migrating their communications to electronic formats. After the recession, e-commerce started to rise and people began to increasingly shop online. This caused the U.S. Post Office's package delivery service to surge. The number of package shipments have doubled since 2009, and they now account for more than 30 percent of its revenue. The Postal Service's aging infrastructure wasn't built to handle this many packages, and its financial debt has made it hard to make the necessary upgrades to compete with private companies like FedEx, UPS, and Amazon. The Postal Service is pretty anxious about the prospects of being in the parcel business. In its financial statements, it regularly warns on the risk sections that the parcel business is not only highly competitive, but that some of the Postal Service's main customers, like Amazon, are building out their own logistics and delivery network. And so the parcels that they're getting today from Amazon or Walmart or others may not be there tomorrow. The Postal Service has negotiation service agreements with private package delivery companies like Amazon, UPS, and FedEx. They use the USPS's last mile delivery service as the final leg in getting a package delivered to hard to reach areas. One of the things the post office loses so much money on is delivering packages for Amazon and these others. Every time they deliver a package, they probably lose three or four dollars. That's not good. They have to raise those prices. Post office experts and internal documents disagree. And in those contracts, the shipper agrees to a certain amount of packaging that's going to be delivered into the system. They agree upon how it's going to be labeled, what kind of delivery system it's going to be, and they negotiate for prices based on that, and they are allowed to give some loss leader prices within the contract, as long as the contract as a whole covers the costs of handling all those packages and contributes to the overhead of, of the Postal Service. The hope was that the commercial products would generate enough revenue to in fact help the monopoly mail and the universal service rather than hinder it. And the profits, the surplus that's made by the competitive products are funneled into the overall operations of the Postal Service, therefore keeping the universal obligations and letter mail more viable than they would otherwise be. The cost to run the U.S. Postal Service has grown significantly. Since 2006, the post office's revenues have failed to cover its expenses. Some of those rising costs include the post office's more than 600,000 workers. They account for more than 75% of its operating costs. Also, the overhead it needs to maintain to meet its universal service obligations doesn't come cheap. First, it has a very heavily unionized workforce. There are four separate unions who represent um, all the so-called craft workers, the letter carriers, the mail sorters, the mail handlers, the mechanics who work on the various vehicles. And so every four years, each of those unions gets to collectively bargain. And no surprise, they try to get better compensation and working conditions for their people. You also have the U.S. population. As our population gets larger, there are more delivery points. If you're another business, 
that means you have discretion usually over what products you offer or how to manage your costs. The challenge for the post office is their mission is largely given to them and is not something they can walk back from. The United States Postal Service is not short of recommendations on how to fix its financial problems. Ideas range from cutting back on six-day delivery, closing unprofitable post offices, merging the retiree health benefit program with Medicaid, to adjusting collective bargaining agreements to account for the financial viability of the post office. The U.S. Postal Service has tried to adopt some of these solutions, but they often conflict directly with its universal service obligations or have generated backlash. Some recent examples are removing the iconic blue collection mailboxes and mail sorting machines, all of which are routine logistical measures. President Trump and Republicans have suggested privatizing the post office. It's an approach that some European countries have adopted and that the Bush administration visited back in 2003. That presidential commission actually said, no, it was not a good idea to privatize because it would not be um, attractive for a private company to run it and it would not be feasible in terms of the obligations the Postal Service has. The Postal Regulatory Commission has proposed adjusting the post office's pricing system for first-class mail. The law does not allow it to raise prices above inflation, which has hindered its ability to raise revenue. Many businesses have opposed raising prices, and there's concern that it could accelerate the decline of letter mail. Other countries have allowed their postal service to go into non-postal services, something the U.S. law prevents the post office from doing. France's post offices offer banking services. The U.K.'s postal service sells life insurance and lottery tickets. Switzerland's post office even runs a bus service in rural areas. The government took over huge liabilities from those postal operations. There's no easy answer. There's costs and liabilities out there that don't go away just by changing uh, one aspect of it. U.S. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy's approach to get the postal office out of its financial rut is to cut costs, raise prices for certain mail services, and reduce service to parts of the country. It's a business approach that many say doesn't work for the postal service. The postal service is not just a business. It is something that includes social obligations. It is enshrined in the Constitution. It's obligated to provide essential communication services to everybody in the country, to 160 million people. A policy that just focuses on making the Postal Service more like a business uh, will hurt the social obligations that the Postal Service has. In the meantime, the Postal Service has enough cash to get by to mid-2021. The House of Representatives have passed two bills to alleviate the post office of its short-term financial burden. If passed by the Senate, one would remove the Postal Service's responsibility to pre-fund its retiree health benefits. The second would be a loan of $25 billion and reverse some of Postmaster DeJoy's recent changes. Since post office workers are legally entitled to their pensions and benefits, Critics say that removing the requirement creates ambiguity over who this financial responsibility falls on. If they are given an infusion of cash, that will help their short-term situation, both from a cash flow position um, and may allow them to do some uh, capital investments, depending what they, how they prioritize and what they do with their money. But without restructuring the basics uh, sort of, of the business model, how, you know, what lines of business you're in, what your fundamental cost structure, it's, it's a band-aid, not a solution. The core questions here about what this service, it needs to be today and into the future and how to pay for it are really core public policy questions um, that can't be answered, you know, by GAO or an advisory group. They can offer suggestions. These are core public, you know, policy decisions that ref, you know need to reflect the values of the country, and that is that's the role of Congress.